Hi, Roy Oppenheim here. One of the things I want to talk about is whether you're a landowner, whether you're a tenant, whether you're a, 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 a homeowner, whether you're retired, whether you own a small business, whether you're a patron, whatever you're, you are, uh, we have something for you today because we're going to be talking about your role uh, in, in this crazy environment that, that, that we're in. One of the things we're going to specifically talk about is liability and, and liability as it relates to uh, what are the obligations and responsibilities as, as a citizen during this crisis. And, and the best analogy I can give is for those of you who've ever snow skied. Um, when you ski, you get a, a ski ticket and, and on there, there is a waiver of liability. There are signs all over the place that basically are telling you that you're going to assume the risk of, of that type of activity because it's inherently dangerous. And as we start to open up our society again, the question is where is risk going to fall as it relates to both the, the business owner and the, 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 the person who is purchasing something, the consumer or, or the user. And we, we're gonna go through today the whole process and analysis of, of what we need to do where, regardless of what side you are on, on the transaction. Um, this is supposed to be interactive. It always has been. So we're going to ask you to ask questions, make comments as we go through this, this process. To be specific, we're going to be talking about first the weekly unemployment rates, the, the waves of infection and general CDC guidelines, the general events, uh, what, what impact it's going to have on major events, what event, what industrial property owners have to do, specific guidelines for, for people who run offices, whether you're a manager, a landlord, a tenant, or even someone who's coming to work, travel in the hospitality industry, what they need to do to make things safe, and what you as a, as a consumer need to consider when you're utilizing those services. And then we're gonna talk about retail spaces and then school, uh, schools and colleges. As I've mentioned, uh, this is our ninth time that we're doing this and that during this crisis, for those of you who know me, we were intimately involved with the last crisis, helping thousands of homeowners uh, get, through, get through the crisis uh, during the foreclosure crisis, during the Great Recession. Unfortunately, this seems very different in some ways, but it has prepared us to try and figure out and analyze how to get out of this, both individually for our company, your company, and collectively for the community. Uh, I've been practicing uh, as well as Ellen uh, for over 30 some odd years uh, as lawyers servicing South Florida, and we're here to continue uh, to do that through, through this crisis. Uh, specifically, Ken Morris, who's joining us today, has, has been uh, in, in, the, in the business, in the real estate business for 30 years. Not only is he a, is a good friend, and we've known his family for many, many years, uh, but he also owns uh, Morris Southeast Group. Uh, I knew his father, who was also involved with that business many, many years ago. He holds a prestigious uh, uh, Society of Industrial and Office Realtors designation and, and is a real property administered de as a designation. Ken's considered an industrial an industry expert covering South Florida commercial real estate. And as I, again, have said, he's also, mo most importantly, a good friend. Uh, our last session, we talked about the panorama of real estate as we are getting ready to reopen as a nation. Since then, uh, we have begun to start to reopen. Palm Beach opened just yesterday. We're supposed to start to open down here uh, next Monday. This week, we'll talk about the best practices for businesses most, uh, that they must implement to avoid liability of the reopening process. And this is going to be a tough issue because we have to use the reasonable person standard. We have to figure out what guidelines we need to follow and just can't have our head in the stand, sand as a, uh, a business owner uh, or manager as we start to reopen our society. Ken Langone from uh, Home Depot probably said it best. It isn't safety or business, it's safety right now, which allows business. Every American can contribute by observing, by observing protocols we now know by heart. The financial chain's gotta be readjusted, concessions up and down the line. Ken Lingone said it, it's really not just about safety or business, but how to conduct business safely. And that's gonna be the watchword of what we're trying to achieve here today. Uh, let's first go over the weekly unemployment rates if we can. Um, we go to page, slide seven. Uh, you know, back in March, uh, we showed you this New York Times on the left uh, uh, front page, which was absolutely insane, which we thought was crazy. And a month later, we're seeing something even even worse in terms of the unemployment rate. It, it, it's a, it's a, a graph that literally runs off the page. Uh, next, next page. Um, one of the issues is, is luring workers back who, who are collecting unemployment, uh, because in some cases, as we talked about last week, they 
there, there's a tendency to want to continue to collect unemployment because it's safer than going back to work if some of your work would require you to be in harm's way. Uh, the April unemployment rate is now at 14.7%, and uh, only about 50% of the workforce is now working. Normally, it's around 64%. That includes retirees and, and, and other people who are obviously not working. Uh, but I want to ask this question, and this is our first poll question, is what do you all think the, the true unemployment rate is currently? Is it 17%, 20%, 25%? You're unsure. Over half of you are suggesting that it's around, oh, no, it's about 25% are saying 52%, 48%, 20%, and that's basically where everyone is. A few people are unsure. The reality is that it's supposedly around 20% right now, and it's probably going to move to that 25, 30% figure that, that we have uh, previously talked about in, in prior seminars. Uh, if we can go to page 10, or nine, yeah, let's go to page 10 if we can. Uh, this is really important because this will talk about what the possible scenarios are over the next 18 months. And this is what we call possible scenario one. And these waves that we have, if we can take the cursor, uh, and we look at the white spaces in between, that is where there'll be social opening. Right now, periods of, of social distancing, we're coming right off of this first wave here. We're having this opening now of society and then there's a potential for a new spike. You close back down, you open back up, you close, you close, and it keeps going for a period of time through possibly 2022 or, uh, un until there, there is um, a way for this to resolve itself. Next slide, please. Uh, scenario two is again, uh, we open up uh, again, and we open up for a period of time all through the summer, and then we have spikes, we close for a small period of time, open up for a period of time, close for a larger period of time, open up again, then close. And then we have a whole period next summer where we actually get a, a reprieve. And then during the winter, it spikes one more time and then it peters out sometime in 2022. And then the third scenario, please, is again similar, uh, but you see multiple waves. And, and, and these are all done by scientists and by computers. And, and this is called the slow burn down. And, and what's important is the bottom slide is how we get either to, uh, and, and this leads to the next question, how we get to herd immunity if we don't get a vaccine? And so the next question is going to be, do you think we'll achieve herd immunity prior to finding a vaccine? And, and just so you all know, herd immunity means that 55% of the population is, is running around with the antigens or, the, or, or what is needed for having had either been exposed to the disease in, in, in some way or another, having the antibodies. The real problem with, with the whole concept of herd immunity, and, it, and it's, it's a theory, but a lot of scientists believe in it, is that we're not sure if you do have the antibodies, if that necessarily means you remain immune to the disease, or if you're just immune for a period of time. What we do know is that it is positive to have the antibodies because you, you end up not necessarily being as infectious for a period of time. So, so the question is, uh, do you think we will achieve herd immunity prior to finding the vaccine? And the answer is yes or no. 21% say yes. Uh, a good chunk of you are not that optimistic, 61% say no, which means that, that you're, and, and then of course about 20% are saying unsure. And it's, it's anyone's best guess, no one's right or wrong on this, uh, but we, we shall see how we get there. But we're either gonna get to herd immunity or we're gonna get to the vaccine, which gets us to the same place. The only difference is that we know is that the vaccine, once it is uh, introduced, should uh, assist in, in resolving this, this crisis like, like smallpox or any other major, uh, pandemic that, that has uh, taken over the, this planet over, over the history of, of man. Um, page 13, uh, the CDC has issued these guidelines. Uh, it's, it's questionable whether the administration wants people to see them or not, but they're now out there and, and this is our best shot of trying to figure out what, what needs to, to be done. Uh, we all know what the routines are of, of, of what we all have to do. Let's go to the next page. Page 14, uh, one of the things that businesses are going to have to do is to communicate, and, and we're going to talk to Ken in a second what that means, uh, visibility, display your, your plans and procedures, and, 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 and emailing folks, and, and, and of course, keeping current on the CDC guidelines. Now, in addition to the CDC guidelines, you'll also have OSHA guidelines, but OSHA, uh, Occupational Safety and Hazard Administration, has not issued anything yet, and, and basically the CDC is what you have. Of course, you'll also have state guidelines, but in all likelihood, the state guidelines will likely follow the CDC guidelines. So for the time being, the CDC guidelines will be our Bible for all of us in trying to figure out what the proper conduct is for our respective businesses. Uh, uh, 
clean vis visibly dirty surfaces, implement rigorous cleaning programs. I mean, these are all basic, basic things, but, but it, it's important to remind them. And of course, here we have a great fashion statement of, of how fashion is now changing too. And I think that's kind of a neat picture. Um, page 16, disinfection, uh, how to disinfect and what the protocols are. The, the EPA has it, has it here. We, we don't have to go into the weeds here, but, but these slides are available to you. We'll have them up and you'll be able to, to figure out what, what is appropriate for your particular situation. Um, page 17, um, I just wanna go through these and, and can we get Ken on also if we can? Um, can you go back one page? Uh, you know, uh, what's interesting here are some questions that we need to ask ourselves. Is, is repetitive testing uh, the new way to go for, for businesses? Uh, may, as an employer, may I ask testing us, supply, may, may I ask testing supplies and our costs from my employers? Uh, do I have to provide them? May I ask employees about their results? Are there privacy issues? Are, are there other issues? Uh, may I test my workforce for antigens? Is there a COVID-proof workforce? May I request uh, test results from people that will attend my events? What's my obligation to, to take people's temperature? Can school test? Can schools test for kids? And of course, we have these privacy issues. And, and Ken, let, let's talk a little bit about what Amazon's plans are. Hi, Ken. Hi, Good to be back. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, this is for all great questions. Problem is, is there's not a lot of answers right now. I think it can be for you. Can, can your, your your mic isn't the best. Can, can you fix your mic, buddy? Can you hear me now? Ah, oh, it's it's kind of muffled. All right, give me a second. I'll fix okay, it. Just get close. Okay, well we're 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 gonna proceed here. Mike Bezo of Amazon is is trying to achieve from the warehouse to your house, almost a, uh, a cocoon of, of, of where everyone is gonna have positive antibodies or be constantly tested. So when that box arrives to your home, you will have some sense of security that it's not contaminated. How he plans on doing that is, is somewhat questionable, but it, it's certainly something that, that is of interest and, and that could be a game changer during, during this, this, this crisis. Let's talk about large scale events. Um, uh, large events for the time being are gonna be risky. Uh, in terms of baseball, for example, we're, we're not sure exactly uh, how the league is planning on starting in July. They probably won't be uh, necessarily spectators. Uh, they may be playing their games uh, in, in one location possibly, or basketball may be doing that. Some, some talk about doing it up, up, up and using some of the Disney facilities is, is one of the options. Uh, religious and social, uh, uh, Assemblies is, is going to be still a question and, and what impact this is going to have on, on organized religion for an extended period of time. Uh, any of these events, vulnerable populations are going to be advised not to attend. Density of the attendees within a confined area, they're talking about, you know, maybe only 25% of the number of people could even be allowed to an event. How that works financially, I don't know, but of course you have television rights, which is probably more important. Uh, and then this is going to be discussion and, and prepare for a, a emergency contact tracing in case attendees test positive after the event and how that's going to work. Uh, and then, of course, it, attendees are going to have to uh, be advised to report positive testing to the organizers. And uh, there'll have to be a, you know, a very, very strict disinfection protocol before, before and after each event. And these are all the questions that you're going to have. And there'll be an assumption of probably, again, that if you're going to attend a large event, it's not going to be on the organizers' uh, liability and responsibility. One of the things I do want to talk about is that a lot of the issues we're talking about end up becoming insurance issues because you do have insurance. And with that insurance, Ken, are you there now? Uh, um, a lot of times you'll be able to shift some of this to insurance companies, but your new policies will probably have massive, massive carve outs for COVID related uh, insurance claims. On, on top of that, you have pen pending legislation right now as it relates to um, uh, pending legislation as it relates to. Uh, trying to find immu immunity and, and exculpation for um, those kinds of businesses that have tremendous liability. And so you would have, for example, um, nursing homes and maybe even cruise ships that are, that are gonna try and, and, and be able to avoid lawsuits uh, because you're going to uh, assume uh, the risk. Excellent. Ken, you there? Right. Uh, the, 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 the cruise ships and all of the other businesses Going to, going to have to go to a, a, a brand new product to the insurance industry to design it. You're not just like the business interruption right now where there's carve out for all uh, virus related. Uh, you're really not looking to pay claims related to uh, the way the web, uh, 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 lawsuits are coming. You will see some new product that comes to the insurance market. 
something that you'll get to pay for it. You get an add-on to your policy, whether for your business or for yourself, or even travel insurance will have to have Ken, 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 we can't really hear you. Do you have a headset or something? I don't know what happened. You sounded great last week. Uh, well, not exactly sure what Headphones, how about headphones? Headphones? Just plug in a headphone. Okay, let me, anyway, keep, I, I want to talk about this picture. This is a great picture. This is in, in South Korea. Uh, they're playing baseball to an empty stadium and they're, they just have fans right now. So it's kind of a, a cool, a cool pick. Um, small gatherings, again, a lot of this is coming from the CDC. Uh, they want you to limit contact, limit contact, limit contact, remove all necessary frequently touched surfaces, try and keep people outside of your facilities, re remove waiting areas. Waiting areas uh, are, are, are really not good doctor's office or any other kind of office, they want you to wait outdoors or in your car instead of in a, in a, in a lobby type, type environment. Uh, and then the, when to evaluate the need for signatures and deliveries and try and figure out how to do that elect electronically. Uh, this is interesting. This is a recent wedding. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the picture at the bottom here are the people who are quarantining in groups where they stayed in little clusters. Uh, the folks uh, on Zoom are all the, all the, the attendees of, of the event who didn't physically attend. And of course, you have the bride and groom. And, and this may be uh, the, the new picture of weddings to come for the foreseeable future until this crisis is abetted. Open houses want to go to the next question. Um, for realtors and, and, and for homeowners who are thinking of maybe selling their homes, would you allow an open house in your home currently? An open house is normally for realtors and, and their clients to come visit the house as opposed to having a scheduled visit uh, ahead of time but with a particular broker. And the answer to those questions are, can I see? If you were to sell your home. I think I know what the answer is. There you go, now you sound good. Okay, if you'd sell your home, would you allow for open houses? The answer is yes or no. Uh, we have a, a very, uh, I guess, I would say conservative or well-informed crowd here right now. Um, and 90% are saying that uh, they would not have an open house, 10% said they would. Ken, are you there, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Me? Okay, now you sound great. Now, you, now you're back. Great, great. Sorry, I didn't like that. What were you saying before? Just if you remember your thoughts. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, the, the, this business is gonna change. It's same with office and industrial and any other type of real estate. You know, you're gonna have video and 3D tours and that's how people are gonna uh, buy houses at least in the next 18 to 24 months as this goes through and we get to some kind of uh, vaccine. Um, most people are not gonna wanna have strangers in their house uh, coughing and sneezing. That's just not gonna happen. So this is, uh, you know, even with masks on. And how do you, as the homeowner, how do you make sure that your realtor who is listing the house is going to police that? What if somebody shows up and they don't have a mask on? How are you going to deal with that? Yeah, no, it, it's, it's going to be an issue. And, and I think, you know, a lot more is going to be done remotely. And, and that's just going to be the way it is. You know, people are going to have to adapt to it, and there's there's no question about it. People were, you know, there was a minority of people who were buying real estate just through 3D videos and other things, and and I think we're going to just see more of that in, in, in the future. It'll probably be a good business for videographers, you know. Um, right. Uh, let's talk about warehouses, because I know that's one of your, your specialties. Yeah, I mean, the, the slide says it all, but I think also one of the things that we need to think about is air distribution in warehousing and also in offices and retail. Uh, that is still up in the air. Uh, what kind of design changes are coming down the pike? And uh, either way, it's gonna be expensive. And HEPA filters are gonna be required. Uh, there'll probably be UV light systems that'll also be implemented in some environments. And uh, all that's gonna add a cost to a tenant's occupancy in the in any real estate doesn't matter whether it's residential or commercial but this is something that is evolving right now we don't know what we don't know uh, we do know that COVID-19 is very virulent a lot of people you can catch it very easily we don't know how to trap it and how well HEPA filters work in those types of systems 
still up in the air right now, unfortunately. No pun intended. Show some crazy filtration systems or air conditioning in this particular warehouse if you see it. The question is, right, we'll just, right, right, right. And most most warehouses uh, are designed just to blow air. It depends on what kind of product that's being stored uh, stored there. If it's pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, it has to be at a constant temperature and a constant humidity level, as opposed to appliances where it doesn't have to be refrigerated. Uh, it doesn't have to meet certain requirements. So all of that has to be factored into what type of warehousing we're talking about. Obviously, food has the highest level, and then when it come, comes down to pharmaceuticals and, and, and other uh, consumer consumables, you know, there's going to have to be a very, very high level of, uh, of uh, uh, integrity related to the air distribution. I, I, and it all also comes down to the employees too. Right. I, I want to go back to Jeff Bezos and, and, and Amazon for a second. Talk to me about what, what he's trying to do because you, you got cut off there before. Well, I think w what he's doing is uh, he's basically going to be creating testing kits that he's going to be sending out to people. He's also going to be uh, really the first one to verify that his uh, deliveries are, are clean and, and you know, virus free. Now, I'm not so sure that's the, the hardest thing in the world because the virus only lives for so long on specific type of services. But my guess is, is they'll be able to implement in their warehouses UV systems and cleaning systems and misting systems. So when that box gets on the truck, very few hands have touched it, if at all, and it's been blasted with UV light, it's been sprayed, and you know when it gets to you, you don't have to worry about, you know, cleaning it up or letting it sit in your garage, depending on what, what the box is. I know the boxes pile up in my house because we're customers of Amazon for many products. But, you know, it, the level of risk related to that is not very high. He's a smart guy by talking about having the testing kits for us as humans, but also the product line. You know, whatever you're buying is, is going to be certified clean. I mean, I guess there's a conceivable notion that you could do most of this without any humans. You could have a robot send it out. You could have driverless trucks actually driving, you know, driving the, the trucks. And ultimately, you could maybe even have a robot, you know, deliver the actual final few steps to, 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 to you. So it's kind of a crazy, crazy idea that, that a way to, to get rid of the, the problem here, and that is uh, ourselves. Um, right. Okay, let's go over specific guidelines for offices because I think this is absolutely critical because it's going to have an impact really on on, on cities and as well as suburbia, but 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 huge impact on, on on metropolitan areas. So let's talk about this. this. is a cute little picture here. People seeing much further apart. Normally, you'd have maybe ten people sitting at this desk. Now you have have four people. Next next page. Um, so let's talk about what what procedures and, and landlords are going to need to do as as well as uh, as as tenants who have employees. Well, what you see right there is an image of thermal cameras, and that's going to be pretty much ubiquitous where you walk into a building or your work your workplace, depending on who your employer is, and there's going to be a thermal camera. I, I think, unfortunately, you know, we're going to have to trade off some, some social liberties. Uh, uh, it's temperatures and where we were, who we were with. Uh, everybody's going to have to, when they come in, maybe even initially early on, sign a form stating that they don't feel sick, that they don't have a cough, that they don't have a fever. And that will provide some liability coverage for the employer and for the property owner or whatever it is. If you have customers coming to your business, you know, thermal imaging will show people that have a fever. The problem is, is the people that aren't feverish, but are still shedding virus. There's no real way to know who's carrying what yet at this stage, but I, I, I'm talking be about, prepared to have, go ahead. I, I'm talking about some legal scenarios here a little bit. I mean, if you have someone who gets sick in a building, I mean, you're not going to be able to prove you got sick in that building unless there was a massive cluster in that building and you were in that building, it'd be kind of like food poisoning. Well, 
it's more likely than not that you got sick where, where you were, where there was a cluster, as opposed to just randomly going to other places where no one else got sick. So, so sometimes it's going to be, you know, a more likely than not scenario in terms of, 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 of who's responsible. So if you got sick in the building, you know, you may argue that you, you have some potential uh, liability, that the landlord has some potential liability. If you get sick where you're employed, you know, workers comp kicks in and sometimes it'll be the workers comp system that, that's going to, that you're going to be actually proceeding under as opposed to a, a direct lawsuit against your particular employer. And then of course, as I mentioned, you're going to have insurance issues and, and what, what insurance contracts are going to look like as they renew. I, I, I know that in terms of a business interruption, you have different kinds of policies out there. You have policies that mention nothing about pandemics. You have policies that mention nothing about viruses, but then you have policies that mention lots of things about fungus, viruses, bacteria, mold and pandemics and specifically included from business interruption insurance. And so what I'm anticipating is that you will have insurance policies that are going to carve out this wide, wide swath of, of, of types of claims. It's kind of like banks, you know, they will lend you money when you don't need it. And when you have a good balance sheet and the minute you don't have a balance sheet, well, guess what? They're not going to lend you money. Insurance companies are very much the same way. They're going to provide you insurance, but they're never going to pay the claim that, that you're because if you know about that claim, you can't insure it because you know about it. And, and, and you can't insure something that you know about because that's not insurance. That's just indemnification. Um, and they're, they're selling insurance, not, not pure indemnification. What are your thoughts on that? I agree 100%. I think it gets even more complex because depending on, and I hate to keep talking about air distribution, but that seems to be my theme of the day, unfortunately. But, you know, certain types of buildings have different types of air distribution. So if there is a cluster of sick people in one office, depending on how the air is distributed in that office building, it could be distributed to everybody in the office building. And then you have a fight set up between the tenants and the landlord on who is responsible for maintaining the HVAC system. And that's a fancy term for air conditioning. Uh, who's responsible for it? Then you have the landlord's insurance company fighting out with the tenant's insurance company and it gets you know, that much more complicated. But uh, ultimately, the liability still exists today. And until I think that the states and the government come up with some kind of, you know, legislation to protect uh, the general business and general, pop, you know, from ge ge us as building owners or as employers, if we don't have that liability coverage, how are we supposed to bring our people in with a clear conscience and also, uh, you know, be able to sleep at night that they can't say they got sick right. you know, I mean, when they came, came to work. Right. I mean, for example, if you're a nail salon, we know that in California, they're claiming that nail salons were one of the big spreaders of, of, of COVID in, in, in California. So the question is, if you own a salon or a spa of some sort, you know, and you open up and, and one person gets sick, that's one thing. But if 10 or 20 people get sick, do you have the insurance to cover that? Or are you going to end up going bankrupt? So it's, 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 it's kind of a question of, which way you go? Do you not open up and therefore you're out of business, or do you open up and take that shot that that, that you're exposing yourself to to you know huge potential liability? And and that's a tough question. And that's why you need to have lawyers involved in these decisions. They're they're not just gut decisions. They're not just decisions that you make on your own. You need to have good, credible counsel who understands this. And and of course, uh, we'd like to think that we're part of that community, but that's that's for you to think about. But more importantly, you need to make those decisions with with proper, proper assistance. Uh, we have some questions here. Uh, can't see you on camera. Okay, let's see. Uh, from Cynthia, do you have to record, excuse me, okay. Do you have to record temperatures for evidence? Who will decide on what is the max temperature that's being recommended as abnormal? 38 degrees Celsius. How do you, how do you imagine that this will be enforced? Will insurance companies recommend or ask for records? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, 98.6 historically was the number, but some people obviously run a little warmer than that. Some people cooler than that. So I guess it's going to be based on, on what you typically run. But I think anything, you know, over 99 or, or, or something, you know, you're, you're, you're sick. And so uh, there will be standards that eventually the CDC will, 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 will come out with. And so we're just going to have to play this by these are the kinds of issues that, that we're going to all have to address collectively as a community. And then, you know, you have these privacy issues. I mean, who wants to know what your temperature is? Is that, is that someone's business? That's a, it's a real question it, it, and a question that can't be answered right now. Next question. Uh, Okay. What about retail shops? Uh, we will. Uh, what about retail shops? We will be held liable for a customer gets sick 
but uh, has traveled to many retail shops. You see, that's, that's exactly the point. If one person gets sick, they're not going to be able to prove that they got, ship, sh they got sick in your shop. But like I mentioned before, it's, it's really like food poisoning. If, if someone gets food poisoning in your restaurant, one person is not going to get sick. They're going to be a whole cluster of people who get sick from food poisoning because they had that same dish. And that's how uh, it is determined that there is food poisoning. And then, of course, they, they do all kinds of subsequent testing. And that's going to be the same thing. They're going to be able to see where someone gets, gets sick. And that's why contact tracing is going to be so critical. And so there's going to be a way to determine wh who you got it from. And if it traces back to your retail shop, the question is, did you do what was reasonably necessary as a reasonable person? And if you did, then the person was assuming the risk. And even if you didn't do what was reasonably necessary, as long as you didn't do something that was outlandish, and you were trying to maintain social distancing, and you had your signs up, and you were doing the right thing, then the question is, did you fall below some standard of care? And we don't know what that standard of care is yet, but we do know that we have to act reasonably uh, as business owners. And, and so the, the, the fallback to that is to make sure that you have good insurance, that if you did it, everything that you were supposed to do, and you get hit by that, that occasional lawsuit, that you have insurance to protect you from that. And, that. and so one of the things you need to do is look at your insurance policies and look, go to your lawyers and say, here, here's my insurance policy. Am I protected when I reopen up? I know that, that any prudent person would want to look at their insurance policy for liability to determine whether or not they, their insurance covers them. Uh, another question? Uh, Ken, I'm sorry, did you want to add to that? Uh, I just saw the other question about contact tracers. Um, they're generally trained by the government, but it's interesting this morning I saw uh, an article where they uh, were talking about a program that you could sign up for like a certificate program to be trained as a contact tracer. Contact tracing is really important in this in a time of a pandemic. A lot of people don't want to engage in it. And you know, going back to the nail salon, the nail salon owner has to make some decisions on in their employee handbook, if they have one, on what it, what are do's and don'ts for coming to work. And then the other thing is I think of like obstetrics doctors, which are Terrific. The problem with obstetrics is that they can't get insurance. They can get it, but they have to pay, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So most OB doctors will have a sign up when you walk through the door that says, hey, we don't carry insurance. And you understand that if you're going to deliver your baby with us. Now, those obstetrics doctors, for the most part, have their assets protected. So from, you know, from lawsuits and they do get sued anyways. But, uh, you know, again, you know, talking with a, a lawyer like Roy, you, you got to know what, and you also have to talk with your, uh, with your insurance, you know, workers' comp. You have to, you know, communicate with them in writing to say, tell me what your policy is related to this. And, and I want to add something, and, and, you know, we had done something on estate planning a few weeks back, and uh, we talked about asset protection planning. It is critical right now that you are looking at asset protection planning if you're a business owner to make sure that God forbid you're sued, that because you took the risk of trying to open up the economy and that's, and, and you're doing the right thing by doing that, by trying to open the economy and trying to keep your employees employed. I mean, to, to be harmed for doing that is just, is just ludicrous. But at the same time, what you need to do is have a plan in place, a, 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 an asset protection plan in place that will not allow for a set of dominoes to trigger basically everything that you've invested in, in your entire life, in your business, you know, to go down because you tried to do something and, and it didn't work as planned. And so I, I, again, implore you to make sure that you are doing asset protection planning as you are trying to reopen. It, it, it should be a concurrent kind of process. I mean, there are really three things you should be doing. Looking at your insurance, opening up real carefully, making sure you have the signs and the assumption of risk categories that, you know, that, that are necessary, doing the right thing, and then, of course, having the asset protection planning as, 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 as your three pillars. So three pillars. You know, doing the right thing, having asset protection planning, and having insurance and having a bank. All three things need to be done if you're going to reopen as, as an employer, landowner, business owner, uh, as a manager to make sure that you don't, don't have liability. Another question. I am on a condo. I'm a condo board president. At some point, we want to open our building to visitors and contractors and open our amenities without creating unnecessary liability. Can you provide advice on this matter? Well, okay, so the first thing we wanna look at, like I talked about, is your insurance policies. You need to look at, at your insurance policies to make sure that if someone does get sick and, you, and, and, and the board gets sued or, or, or the organization gets sued, that you have insurance. So that's pillar number one. Number two, you need to find out what is reasonable, what other management companies are doing, what other buildings are doing, and do something that's consistent with what the community is doing so you're not an outlier. 
of course you're going to have to let contractors in. There's a flood, if there's an emergency, but a lot of buildings are just allowing certain contractors in for certain kinds of emergencies. Can you prevent someone from moving into the building you know, if, if, if uh, someone moves out? The answer is probably not, but you can create standards. You may have to do some background checking. You may have to do some, some contract tracing. You may have to take temperatures. I mean, there's certain things that you may have to do. So that's, the, that's, that's pillar number two is a reasonable thing. And then third, the condo itself should be doing asset protection planning and making sure that their assets are not going to be subject to some kind of uh, liability if, in fact, there, there, there is a, a loss. So again, the three pillars we talked about are going to be important as it relates to uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, individuals and, and contractors back into. Ken, any, any thoughts? No, I agree 100%. Um, you know, the, the members of that condo board have to uh, check what their liability is and what kind of coverage the condo association provides. I don't want to step into your purview, you know, in the legal environment, but, um, you know, the condo board and the condo rules and, and regulations are likely going to have to change right. about how soon you can move in and, you know, what forms you have to fill out about where you've been and the day that you're going to move in or you're going to send vendors in, everybody has to agree to, you know, thermo, uh, uh, thermal imaging and signing a form that states that they're not feeling any, uh, any uh, uh, adverse effects of, of COVID and uh, none of their uh, immediate household members have it, et cetera, et cetera. No, I got it. Uh, I'm going to go to slide 30 here, if, we, if, if you all don't mind. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, a little bit about when employers hope to limit liability. One of the things they're going to probably do is, is, is put more cameras up inside their own organizations to, to basically try and make sure that people are not ignoring uh, social uh, limit, limitation uh, responsibilities and eventually become scoff laws of, of some, some point. Uh, you know, there'll be engineering controls. You talked about the HE, administrative controls, education of employees. And, and making sure that you're providing the proper management. There was a question earlier about what can realtors do to protect themselves, and that is to make sure that you're responsible and doing the right thing. And then the question is, uh, if you do get sued, you know, what insurance do you have? Are you insured under your broker? Uh, or do you have to have your own insurance? Do you have a corporation that's gonna provide you corporate, a corporate shield? I mean, these are all kinds of things that we're talking about in terms of asset protection planning. I mean, certainly if you're a realtor, you should be operating under your own company. That will provide you some protection. And then in terms of insurance, you need to look at whether your broker's coverage covers you or, or if you're a member of, of, of being a realtor alone provides you some, some coverage or do you need to have excess coverage. One of the things you all should probably have is umbrella insurance, which, which protects you from any uh, and all liabilities over and above. Uh, your, your base coverage on, on any policy. And so umbrella coverage historically has not been very expensive and I would highly uh, recommend that. And that's something else that we, we can certainly talk to you all about individually. Um, uh, what, Ken, if you wanna talk about OSHA a little bit, I'd appreciate that. Uh, well, as, as you can see from the slide, OSHA is not, hasn't caught up to reality, but I think the SARS COVID-2 regulations are probably good enough for the time being. Um, I think, um, more than ever, you're going to have to have communications with your employees and your visitors about what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Um, and uh, uh, I think you're going to have to have uh, more uh, hand sanitizer stations set up throughout your, your workspace or your shop or whatever your business is. And uh, I think what's going to happen, uh, certain like the U.S. government is, is pushing to open up all of their federal offices. And that's run by the General Services Administration. They're talking about even having if one station workstation is occupied, and that after that one day that station stays dark or is not occupied for a whole other week. So there's a lot of things that are still in flux and trying to be figured out. But uh, you know, what is a safe working environment? Uh, obviously, space. Obviously, using uh, you know masks. That's going to be with us for quite some time. And uh, I think uh, it's a fluid situation, just like things have been with other government agencies like the uh, SBA and the CDC. You know, you're going to have to keep up with, uh, with what OSHA is saying just to stay abreast and, and stay safe. And, and I'm going to ask you a question that, without naming names because we've been talking about this. But when you speak to uh, um, tenants, what, how quickly do you think they're going to open up again, you know, notwithstanding uh, governments uh, saying that, you know, you can go back to work? Well, I have some colleagues in my industry that their employers are saying that they're giving the, their employees what they call employee choice. If they don't want to come back, 
they're not forcing them to come back. Um, and I think we're gonna we're gonna see that. Some people cannot work from home because of the nature of the work that they do, but and some people can't stand working from home. But I think most of the tenants that I work with and uh, employers that I work with, they're all basically saying we're going to get some of our people back, but we're not going to ever get all of our people back. And we're going to have to do it in a way where it's going to make sense. And that's going to be staging, having you know different shifts of employees coming and going. Like I said before, the nine to five uh, work schedule is kind of out the window for most people that aren't working on a shop floor or plant floor. And uh, I think all of that is, is going to happen in order to provide a, a safer environment, less intense environment of people being close to each other. Right. The other thing is, be. and the other thing, this picture kind of says it all, to what extent, if you have to wear a mask, do you want to wear a mask eight hours a day? You know, and, and, and people would just rather probably work at home if they have that opportunity, probably based on, on if the requirements were to wear a mask at the workplace constantly. You know? Well, I was told I have a face for radio, so I, if I put on a mask, you know, that, you know, maybe it might might help things. You know? yeah, it, may, it, it may. Okay, I want to go to question number four. Uh, we're, we're talking about travel, okay? And if we go to question four, please. Okay. Uh, I want to read it. Uh, okay. Uh, question four. Thank you. Have you or your have you or are you planning on booking a cruise in the near future? It's multiple choice. Or a book considering to do so and no. Well, I keep getting flyers in the mail for all these exotic cruises all over the world. So um, someone is, is, is booking and the, and, the, and the travel industry claims that people are booking for 2021 and 2022. But I can tell you one thing. It doesn't look like it's this group except for 3% who would consider doing so in the future. Um, and um, I think until we have this, I mean, the big problem is, and we'll go to the next slide, Lance. Um, um, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll talk about airlines first. And if we, if we see this picture here, this was just from yesterday, and this was taken by a doctor. I think he was at Stanford, and he was going home from New York. And he was just appalled because he expected the middle seats to be empty. And, and uh, subsequently, the airline uh, that was involved, I won't mention any names, uh, said they never promised to be em empty, to keep the middle seat empty. But going forward, they will keep the middle seat empty. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a funny situation. Uh, you want to talk about the airlines real quick, Ken? Yeah, I've got a good friend who's a chief pilot of uh, a major carrier. Uh, he's a chief pilot for, for Fort Lauderdale. And their new protocol is no middle seats, uh, maximum 92 passengers on any aircraft. Um, they also sent me a video showing that the air exchange inside the cabin it's, it's brand new air every three minutes. And the air is filtered through HEPA filters. So, you know, they're, they're, you know, some airlines are trying to get ahead of it. I know which carrier this is, and it's appalling, uh, that, that photo. I think those days are, are behind us, and I think most people are not gonna stand for it. And their airlines are studying right now, especially my friend's carrier, on different types of fogging, uh, how often they're going to be cleaning them, how, uh, uh, how extensive. And, you know, I think what's going to happen is ultimately airline pricing is going to go up because you're going to have less passengers on board. Well, it just has and, to be. Right. But I will add that, you know, and I don't want to get into political economics here, but many airlines historically around the world have always been subsidized by their countries, whether it was yes. Air or Lufthansa or any of the yeah. South American airs, uh, airlines like LAN, uh, um, the reality is, is that um, the business model of airlines may have to dramatically shift and that flying may have to become a utility as opposed to part of the competitive marketplace uh, of capitalism that we are accustomed to because this won't work. And then when you raise the prices, that doesn't work either because then people can't fly. And so the question is, how do you keep the economy going? How do you keep the world going? If uh, airlines uh, remain part of our current economic structure. And I'm not suggesting one is right or one is wrong, so don't mis misinterpret what I'm saying. But I'm, I'm, I am saying that the system as it currently works will not work going forward if we pull out the middle seat and only put 90 people on a plane because 
the, the cost of flying would be so expensive that it, it will destroy the hotel industry. It will destroy Uber. It will destroy the condo industry. It will destroy spring break. And I can go on and on how, what, what it will destroy. And so we're going to have to figure out how to get people flying again in a way that works for our society and our economy. Next, next, next slide, please. <laughs> next, next page, please. Okay. These are CDC uh, guidelines now that are coming through. And what's interesting is if you go on a trip, they're suggesting that you have to basically stay home and self-quarantine. And when they say a trip, I think they're talking about a cruise or a plane right now. And so as long as you have to now stay home 14 days and you have a vacation and you're supposed to be back at work, I have no idea how that works. I just have no idea that how that works. And I just put that out, out there. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, and now, uh, you know, these are other guidelines, which are, and I'll let you you'll deal with these. These are just for, for employees in general, Ken. You there? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, it says it all. I mean, again, uh, some people are desperate to, to, to be at work and continue getting their paychecks. Um, I think it's, uh, again, goes back to uh, how aggressive the employer is gonna be able to be to keep everybody honest and, uh, and I think new protocols, you get to the office, you wash your hands. Uh, you get up to go to the bathroom, obviously you wash your hands. Uh, everything is gonna change. And I think these messages are gonna have to be repeated often in, in many places. Um, and uh, you know, back to cruise ships and airlines quickly, I agree with a comment made by one of uh, the people uh, uh, who are watching that, yeah, um, cruise ships you know, historically have been reservoirs for other disease, uh, you know, like norovirus and, and, and other uh, and other fun viruses. And I think, you know, I have to ask myself, even if I wanted to go on a cruise ship, do I want to be stuck on one for six weeks? You know, that happened to, uh, to several uh, different cruise ships and passengers. Uh, they could not get off and they were stuck in their rooms, in their cabins. And it was, uh, it was terrible. So, I don't know how good of a marketing program the, the cruise ship industry is gonna be able to come up with, but it's gonna be have to be a good one in order to get a lot of people on those boats. Um, I, I'm gonna to switch to questions, and there's a possibility we're actually not gonna to get to the rest of these slides, and we're just gonna continue this next week because there's just so much, and then we'll backfill on, on new information because this is gonna go on and on, and the liability for all of us, we have to remember those three pillars that, that, that we're talking about. And I'm just gonna repeat them again. You got to be reasonable in terms of protecting your, your, your employees. You have to be reasonable in terms of protecting your vendors and, of course, your, your customers. And then you have to look at insurance and you have to look at asset protection planning. And if you don't have those three in place, you have no business being in business and you have no business doing this because you're just setting yourself up for disaster. And we'll end up having to go back to our bankruptcy you know, seminar from a few weeks ago. But let's go to the next question if, if we can here. Because uh, how can realtors protect themselves? Um, I think we kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, we, we said that they should be setting up their own corporations, their own LLCs, and looking at insurance and look at asset protection planning again. Next question. Um, can, can you discuss Social Security Administration mandatory physical examinations for their clients since all pat patients need to be seen in person to qualify? Uh, I, I don't know if we're talking about disability, um, so I, I can't answer that question. Do you, uh, I, I don't understand that question. Uh, to get regular Social Security, you know, when you turn 65, you don't have to be examined. So it must be for, for disability, and I'm not sure how they're going to do physical examinations right now. It's going to be interesting. Next, next question. Um, okay, can we have clients sign releases uh, or liability for COVID? And, and, and thank you for these weekly Zooms. It's, it's our pleasure to do these, and as long as people show up, we'll keep doing them. So you need to tell your friends and, and, and family uh, that we're going to keep doing it, and it's a great opportunity for you to ask questions and, and, and have us think about this process and what this is all about. Because without the questions, you know, we, we can't come up with any, any of the answers. Um, but in, in, in terms of the question, can you have clients sign releases or liability? I think you can. I, I'm going to go back to the skiing uh, because that's, that's the assumption of risk. So when you get that ski ticket while you don't sign, it says that when you pay for that ticket, the back of the ticket has huge liability uh, waivers on it. And so when you fall and you break that bone, in all likelihood, you're not going to be able to sue the ski resort. Now, there are exceptions, and that is if there was a, something that was really dangerous and it, it should have been told to you and it's something unusual and, and it's not something that's part of the, the standard risk of skiing, then you can typically still sue the, the ski resort. But those are exceptions, and there are. 
And so I think with this COVID thing, it's going to be kind of the same thing, that you can put a sign up that tell people they're assuming the risk of, of whatever they're doing by coming in. And then the question is going to be, uh, did they assume some other risk? Like you knew that there was someone there right then and there who, who was infected and you knew it and you didn't tell people that that will not be exempt. I mean, that's willful and wanton negligence. I mean, it's, it's beyond negligence. It's just reckless. And so that kind of conduct will, will still not, not be protected, but, but putting signs up and telling people that, that they're assuming some risk, I, I think is going to be the norm, just like the doctor's offices uh, who run bare, uh, you know, without insurance, they're, they're telling you that up front. And so I think we're going to see a lot of that and there is going to be some sort of legislation and then your insurance companies are going to dictate what they're going to want to see from you. Uh, in terms of, of, of what they think is a reasonable way for you to conduct themselves. Is there another question? Uh, oh, as a vacation rental owner, can I also be sued if someone gets sick? Well, as a vacation rental owner, you own property. Property owners are always liable and responsible. You do have insurance, so your insurance company uh, should hopefully cover you, but the person's gonna have to prove that they got sick there. I mean, if they were going out to restaurants, uh, they were going out to other events and things while they were at your place, how are they gonna prove that they got sick at your place? And the answer is that if you, in, that you had four people there and they all got sick and they all didn't go to the same events, but they all still got sick, you know, now there, there, there is an, a, a, there's causation uh, and there's, there's going to be you know, an evidentiary issue of, of whether or not they all got sick there or not. And that's going to be the tough part for lawyers is to prove where and, and when someone got sick. And, but, but remember, these folks who are going to be uh, uh, actually uh, doing the research, uh, what are they called again? The, uh, the, contact the, tracers. Contact tracers. They're going to get pretty good at this, and they're going to figure out where you got sick from, and um, and then that that can be used as as evidence. What What are your thoughts, Ken? Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. You know, I think if you follow the Airbnb guidelines, where you know there's a mandatory three day uh, uh, dormant period between one guest and the next, and you you know you have uh, uh, use CDC cleaning guidelines from one guest to another, chances are you're going to be just fine. But that's not just dusting a space and, and so forth. That's using uh, cleaning uh, uh, solutions with bleach in them and so forth. And it has to be done in a proper way. Otherwise, um, you know, you, you could be exposed, like Roy, like Roy said. Okay, I, I want to just finish off on cruises and we'll, and we'll do the other sections next week. But, but if you're going to go on a cruise and, and assuming the cruising industry comes back, first of all, they're probably only going to allow 25% of the people on a cruise. Uh, the, the, the restaurants and dining facilities are going to have to change. There'll certainly be no buffets. The coffee bars are going to be gone. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to the gambling facilities because those all have to be spaced at, at you know, the same social spacing. But it's going to be interesting because the CDC is requiring or recommending that once you go on a cruise, that you're going to stay at home for 14 days. Uh, if you get sick on board, they have protocols. And then this is really crazy. The next page is this um, uh, daily uh, uh, form that you're going to have to fill out, basically saying what your temperature is each and every day, if you're healthy, if you're sick. Uh, and, and it's, it's going to be very, you know, it's just going to be part of the new procedures. And, and, you know, you're going to say, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to do this. And, you know, when we, after September 11th, you know, no one wanted to take their shoes off. No one wanted to go through scanners. We didn't have any of that in, in 1999 and in 2000. 2001, we all were willing to do that as, as part of the price to continue flying. And so obviously people are going to be willing to go through some of this if they want to keep cruising. And, and there will be some period of time for social adjustment and behavioral modification. And, and, and I guess it'll be okay. I, I, you know, I just can't say, but it is not going to be business as usual. And now with the cruise industry, unlike the airline industry, or maybe it is like the airline industry, I'm not sure how they operate profitably if they can only put 25% of the people on board and they still have to keep almost the same number of employees to run the ship. I don't know how that works. I don't know, you know, how that model in, in, it works for them. It's, it's something that, that just is beyond me. And the question is, is that also going to be deemed a utility? And I'm going to suggest that recreational cruising is less of a utility than an airline. And, and let me just explain that while you are flying in that airline and, and, and your stuff is in, is in the belly, there is US Postal Service stuff in the belly, there may be Amazon stuff in the belly, there is huge amounts of cargo that, that are on that, on that plane. And that stuff has to continue to travel whether there are any passengers or not. And so the whole cargo industry of keeping this country going is, is really at, at the crux of why we're gonna have to keep the airline industry going regardless of how we finance it. And, and the cruise industry is just a little bit different than that. Ken, any final thoughts? Because then we're done. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think that uh, the airline industry is, is integral to uh, the strategic uh, uh, infrastructure of our country. And, you know, this time last year, there was, I think, 2 million passengers a day going through PSA. 
uh, I think last week, I think we talked about it. There's like 100,000 uh, passengers going through on the same day this year versus last year. You know, that says it all. Um, business cannot be conducted without movement of cargo and people. It is going to come back. It's just going to take time. And I think the airline industry is going to need to be uh, taken care of in order for us to have multiple options as carriers. Uh, I can tell you, uh, just speaking personally, I'm not going to want to go on vacation and fill out a log to, to how I'm feeling. That's just me. I'm lazy. Uh, I admit to it, but uh, it doesn't seem like a whole lot of fun. So uh, something to think about on your next cruise if yeah. you want to. But, but you may be different. Than else. Some people may, may be willing to do that. Um, I want to I want to sign off just with with a few reminders. Number one, uh, our title company is is open. We're open virtually. We're doing both remote closings as well as mobile closings anywhere in the state, as, as well as other parts of the country. Uh, and so we've been very busy. And, and to the extent you have any uh, needs in, in that area, obviously we're we're there for you. And more importantly, we're providing steep discounts to those of you who participate in in, in these webinars with us in providing consultations on, on the issues that, that we're addressing, whether it's a bankruptcy issue, the asset protection issue, uh, the estate issue, or just trying to figure out your insurance needs or how to keep your, your place open or to decide if you want to reopen. Those are the kinds of things that we're, we're grappling right now. And of course, with landlords, we're dealing with how do they collect rent? How do they keep their, their mortgage company off, off them? How do they defend themselves? Because being a landlord right now is, is also not a picnic. And, and unlike like last time, I'm going to say this again, while we villainized the banks last time and they deserved a lot of, 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 of the attention for the crisis that occurred you know, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, the banks are not the villains here. And I'm not sure if the insurance companies are going to be the villains. I'm not sure if there's going to be a villain. I mean, obviously the virus is a villain, but it's not, it, it's not human. It, you know, it's, it's, in, it, it's, it's mother nature. And, and I don't think we want to villainize mother nature because we're going to lose on that one. But, but the point is we're, we, we have to figure out how to get through this, whether it's six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, we're going to get through this. There are going to be survivors. There will be winners, you know, and, and the losers will be people who, who put their head in the sand, who don't figure out what to do and don't have a plan for themselves. And like we did last time, we're here to help you create your plan. And, and Ken's part of that too. So Ken, any final words? Uh, the lack of a, a, a vibrant public health system is part of the villain here. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you again for having me. Uh, it was fun and uh, enjoy talking about what's going on and what could be uh, coming down the pike. Anyway, thanks so much. Zoom at noon next Tuesday again. Roy Oppenheim for Oppenheim Law and Western Title. Thank you again, everyone, for helping put this together. Uh, may you all stay well and healthy. All the best.